should be looking at page five in your ecosystems lab notebook. We're going to be looking at symbiotic relationships. So the first thing is looking at an ecological niche. So you may have heard that term in sixth grade. The niche is the role that an organism plays in its environment. So that's going to include what it eats, how it gets its food, how it interacts with other organisms. So organisms are only going to be able to play their role in the environment. And if you have multiple organisms that are trying to play the same role, then you might end up having competition and a decline in species. So in this example, you have several different warblers. So that's, of course, the type of bird. So the Cape May warbler is going to be pretty much confined to the top of the spruce tree. So that's the habitat that it lives in. So the Cape May warblers are going to be feeding off of insects and things that live in that part of the spruce tree. While you have the bay breasted warbler that's going to be in the middle of the tree primarily and the yellow rump warbler that's going to be towards the bottom. So if you had some kind of issue with the decline, for example, in the top of the tree, if it started dying for some reason, if it had an infestation of a certain type of beetles or whatever, the Cape May warbler is going to need to find another habitat. So it's going to need to find other food sources as well. So if it starts encroaching on the territory of the warblers that are further down in the tree, then that means that there's going to be less food and space available for the bay breasted warbler and the yellow rumped warbler. So that might end up causing some issues within species with competition. So in this example, you have two different types of squirrels. We have the gray squirrel and the red squirrel. So the red squirrel is one that you're probably not familiar with. It um, is one that lives in the United Kingdom. So it's going to be found in England, and it looks very different from the squirrels that we have around here that look like this one at the bottom. So if you end up having these two squirrels that live in the same area, they're going to be searching out the same food. They're going to be looking for the same type of habitat. So they live in different areas. In this example of the lions, you have two lions, of course, that you could tell they're fighting it out over some reason. So think about what types of things those lions might be fighting about. They might be fighting about space. They might be fighting about territory, food, water. And even in this example, you've got a lioness back here in the background. So this example, they're probably going to be fighting about a mate. You have several different pictures as examples here. We have a couple different foxes, we have some marks on a tree, and then we have a lion and a cheetah. So when you have two organisms that are trying to occupy the same role in a habitat, they're going to be competing. They cannot coexist in the same habitat, especially if they're apex predators and they're going to be uh, hunting the same type of prey, for example. So competition is going to lead to a decrease in the species population. So think about why might that be? Why might you have a decrease in a species population if organisms are competing? Well, they might end up killing each other, right? So if one organism ends up dying versus the other, you're going to have a decline in that particular population. Or one organism might end up having to leave that particular area because the other organism is the one who is going to be more dominant. So you have two uh, foxes that could be fighting about space or shelter, food, mate. Marks on the tree right here, you end up seeing those with a lot of different types of animals, with felines, Bears do that as well. Elk are an example of an organism that they're similar to deer. They have antlers. They live in Yellowstone is where I've seen them a lot. So the antlers on the elk are going to be sort of furry. They're kind of fuzzy. And as it ages, as it gets a little bit older, it's going to basically like mark its territory by scratching the antlers up against the tree. And so that not only gets the fur, the fuzzies off of the antlers, but also leaves a scent, a chemical marker on the tree so that other elk know that that particular elk has been there. Predation. So this is a term that you probably have heard before, and it's just referring to predator versus prey. So when you have an animal that's a predator, that means it's going to hunt and kill another organism to eat it. So it's going to obtain its energy by doing that. And the organism that gets hunted and killed and eaten is called the prey. So you have several examples here. You have a snowy owl that has caught a mouse. This is a ladybug. And it's eaten a little or is in the process of eating a little bug that's called an aphid. Bears, a lot of time we eat salmon, fish is what you see here. And a lot of organisms are going to be really fast like the cheetah in order to 
catch its prey, especially if it's fast, if the prey itself is fast moving. So when you look at this graph, this is the same one that's in your lab notebook. This is a predator versus prey population graph. And you are likely to see this on your EOG or have questions about the population of predator versus prey. So you can see in red, this is the snowshoe hare population, which is the prey. And then the blue is the lynx population. A lynx is a type of feline, and that is the predator population. So you can see that starting off in 1855 is where this graph begins and goes through 1925. So the population of the snowshoe hare, the predator population, has a dramatic increase. And what you also notice with the lynx population is that this predator population has increased as well. And then when you see the prey, the prey population declining, so you can see it going down here, the prey population uh, causes the predator population to start declining as well. So why is that? Why does the prey population go up and the predator population go up and then they both start going down? So if you think about that for a minute, if you've got more food available, so this big spike here, more food's available, then the predator population is going to be able to reproduce, which means it's creating more of those predators. So it's increasing in the population, as you see here. And then there's so many predators that the prey population ends up declining and they start dying off because they're all being eaten. And then the pr predator population ends up decreasing as well because there's not enough food. So some of them are starving or they're competing against one another and they're fighting it out and somebody's dying. So it's kind of like if the cafeteria has uh, cheeseburgers available for lunch and there's only one cheeseburger and about 400 students to serve, then all the students go into the cafeteria are either going to fight it out over that one cheeseburger or in the majority of cases not get to eat. So there are different symbiotic relationships. So the stem sim SYM is similar to SYN, S-Y-N, referring to together. And then bio, of course, refers to life. So a symbiotic relationship is going to be referring to two different organisms that have some kind of interaction together. So you see a little picture here of an alligator and some birds, and the birds flossing the alligator's teeth. Well, birds don't actually floss alligators' teeth, but there are some that live in a symbiotic relationship where they will end up kind of pecking at and picking out the food particles from around the alligator's teeth or eating the plaque and stuff that has accumulated around the alligator's teeth. So it kind of cleans the alligator's teeth and also the birds get food. Nemo. You may have seen Finding Nemo. So here's our little clownfish and what's all this stuff? Anemone, so a sea anemone. Clownfish live on sea anemones, and this is an example of a symbiotic relationship because if you think about finding Nemo, the clownfish can hide in all these tentacles of the sea anemone, which are poisonous. So when the clownfish is living in the sea anemone, it's kind of immune to the uh, poison or toxin that's produced by the sea anemone. And then the sea anemone is kind of inhabited by the clownfish, so other organisms will generally leave it alone. So mutualism is when both organisms benefit. So there's a relationship between the organisms and one organism is going to benefit and the other organism benefits as well. So it's like a smiley face and a smiley face. They're both happy. So the examples that you see here are the zebra and these birds on the zebra's back are oxpecker birds. So they a lot of times will live on different mammals like zebra, oxen, uh, water buffalo, things like that. And they will basically eat the bugs, the mites, the ticks off of that particular mammal. So in this example, the birds are eating or will be eating the insects that are on the zebra. So it's good for both of them because the zebra doesn't have ticks biting it and then it's also good for the birds because they get food. You also have a bee here and flowers so bees will pollinate flowers and they also are able to get the nectar. This is a spider crab in the second picture. So the spider crab is covered with algae so that's a mutualistic relationship. And then here's a termite. So termites have a organism that live inside of their gut, basically inside of their digestive system, uh, some different microorganisms in there that will help to break down the cellulose and the wood that the termites consume because the termites can't actually digest the cellulose in wood. The microorganisms in its body have to do that for it. Commensalism is the second symbiotic relationship. So commensalism is when you have two different species and one of them benefits and the other one doesn't really care that the 
organism is there living on it or in it. So you have chicken lice in this example. So this is showing you an up close view of chicken feathers and the lice that can live on chicken. So the chicken really doesn't care that the lice is there and the lice just kind of feeds off like the dead skin cells and stuff on the chicken. So it's not really like where if humans get lice, the lice is very itchy or bothersome. It's a little bit different for the chickens and different avian species. The top picture is showing you some really pretty bromeliads that you can see in a lot of rainforest habitats. Orchids will do this too sometimes, but they basically are growing either attached to or on the side of a tree. So the tree doesn't mind that the bromeliad is there, but the bromeliad is able to get a little bit higher so that it can get more access to sunlight. And then you have the shark down here, so you may be familiar with this fish. So the remora is a specific type of fish that basically will sw swim along with the shark and sometimes they can attach to the shark and the shark eats a lot of food. The shark's not going to sit there and like cut up a little piece of steak or something. It basically chomps down on and will shred whatever it's eating. So the fish, the remora, are basically going to eat the little giblets that the shark doesn't eat that's fallen out of its mouth. And parasite. So parasitism is the last one. So for parasitism, much like we've talked about with viruses, the parasite has to live in a host organism or on a host organism. So parasitism is where one organism is going to benefit and then the other one does not benefit. The other organism, which is the host, is going to be harmed or either killed in some examples. So there are certain types of fungi or algae or bugs in this case that will live on caterpillars. So it's kind of attached to it and can end up killing the caterpillar. Here's a nice little uh, pinworm living in somebody's eye. I'm sure that's quite painful. And they can be pulled out and extracted from under the conjunctiva that lines the eye. But again, imagine that's painful. Some hookworms that have burrowed into someone's feet. And also, remember, we talked about bot flies. When a mosquito that has bot fly larva attached to it, will bite a human or other mammal, it can insert bot fly larva, which grow under your skin and can be extracted, but also, again, causes harm. It's painful. So an example of the parasite, the parasite benefits because it gets to live on a host and the host is harmed or in some cases killed. So you should have all your notes for Eco3 symbiotic relationships complete.